we're going to be taking a look at two passages today that really are connected um, for a couple of reasons. But I actually want to start with the big idea. And even though we haven't talked about the theme very much, I want to see if you can guess it. And then at the end, I'll come back and check in and see if you remember it. So two tests today. If God is so great, which we know that he is, if God is so great, we cannot help but what? What do you think? That's a great guess. Honestly, that's what I wish I would have put there. But I was going from verse 36. Actually, yeah, verse 36. And Jesus charged them to tell no one, but the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. If God is so great, we cannot help but proclaim. It's almost like we're powerless to stop it because we have so big a story, so exciting a story to tell that it just bubbles out of us. We can't even stop ourselves. Even these people in this story that were directly touched by Jesus's ministry were so impacted by that, that even though that for that particular example, they were charged not to speak, they couldn't help themselves. There's a lot to be learned from that. So I'll check in at the end and see if you guys remember. So um, just a quick review from last week. Um, three things I want to point out just to jog our memory, which is important to, to understanding this, this passage in the proper context. Number one, from last week, we learned that the Pharisees and many of the Jews that were underneath the Pharisees' teachings had a hard time with the gospel because as they were listening to the gospel, repeatedly they were tripping over their own traditions. So that became a stumbling block for them. They could not reconcile many of the things that Jesus said and did in his ministry with the the traditions that they had had for many, many years. The problem was that a lot of those traditions were man-made and imposed on those people with no scriptural basis. And so when Jesus comes through and breaks one of those traditions, everybody um, starts to think that he's some sort of lawbreaker. And so they have a hard time taking his message as the truth because in their minds, well, he's breaking all of our cherished rules and values and traditions. The problem is that none of those rules and values and traditions were rooted in scripture, the ones that Jesus broke. Because, of course, Jesus was without sin. So, number one, the Pharisees had a very hard time with the gospel because of their traditions. Two, it is the evil within that defiles a person. There are many things, many influences from the outside that can infiltrate us, but that's not the root cause of of any of the evil. It's not the the boogeyman outside. It's actually, it's the evil within our own heart. And there are influences from the outside that can help to well some of those things up within us. So obviously we need to be guarded against the outside, but it's it's our own hearts that defile us. And the third thing is that the heart of a hypocrite is far from God. We're going to look at two examples of some people today whose hearts, I would say, were, were much closer to God, even though geographically, culturally, ethnically, they were much further away. But they were, they were close to God in a very real and personal sense. So starting at verse 24. And he arose from there and went to the region of Tyre and Sidon. So in the previous text, we learned that Jesus had declared all foods unclean which is interesting because right after he does that, he goes to a very unclean location, you could say, into the heart of Gentile territory. These people were not from Israel, and there was a lot of of bad blood, historically speaking, because these people in these territories were descendants of, and especially the woman he talks to, descendants of the Canaanites, which if we know our Old Testament history, the Israelites were actually commanded to go through and wipe out the Canaanites in their quest to take the promised land. So these are people groups that have been in conflict for thousands of years. So he goes into those territories. Now, we don't see an explanation in Scripture as to what exactly Jesus and the disciples were doing there. We could gather a few ideas of what he may have been doing. Maybe he was seeking rest. I think it's an interesting place to do that. But he may have been seeking rest. Um, he may have been looking for a private place to teach the, uh, the, the disciples He may have just been looking for a bit of respite from the Pharisees and all of their questioning and constantly debating with them at every stop. We don't really know. But what we do know is for this particular moment, Jesus' healing ministry was not the number one priority for why he was there. And this this is not an uncommon moment. This has happened several times throughout his life where 
Jesus goes to a specific place at a specific time to accomplish a specific purpose. And so he has a, a priority there, which really the priority that guided his entire life was to do the will of the Father. So whatever it was that Jesus and the disciples were doing in Tyre, they sought out isolation. They closed themselves up inside of a house, and, and they were trying to stay away from people for whatever reason. So at this particular moment, that healing ministry was not his number one priority. So when he travels to Tyre and seeks isolation, um, the disciples were a, a little bit perturbed. They actually were deeply annoyed with this woman for, for questioning and, and, and finding them. So just take a look, uh, if you will, uh, verse 25. But immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. Flip back a few pages, if you would, to Matthew chapter 15. Because there's an interesting detail hidden in Matthew's account, which kind of shows us what's going on in the disciples' minds at this time. Matthew chapter 15, looking at verse 23. Matthew 15, 23. Again, it's a parallel account, but this detail is not found in Mark's gospel. But the disciples, excuse me, but he did not answer her a word, meaning the, the Syrophoenician woman. He did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and begged him, saying, send her away, for she is crying out after us. So despite this woman's desperate attempt to get to Jesus, begging him, please heal my daughter, Jesus at first actually doesn't even answer her, and then the disciples are deeply annoyed with her that she won't go away. Now, there's a reason for all of this. We'll get to it in a minute, but just think about that for a second. What a strange scene. When have we seen Jesus not give somebody an answer or not immediately give the person begging for healing what they had asked for? When have we ever seen something like this unfold? So immediately, a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit. So we, we learned two important details from that, from that phrase. Her daughter was young. She was little. Her little daughter, her cherished young daughter, was possessed by a demon. So when she heard of him, it's interesting that she throws herself down, head to the floor, at his feet. I don't know if this was a sign of, of humility or if we could say it went to the extent of worship, but either way, we know that she recognized that this was a man of authority and of power. Which is ironic, coming from a Syrophoenician, Canaanite, descendant, Gentile. How could she have any clue who she was talking to? The Phoenicians were descended from the Canaanites, and she was a Gentile. She was, by birth, a Syrophoenician, born in that country and descended, therefore, from the ancient Canaanites. So when she asks and, and throws herself at Jesus' feet, and she asks for Jesus to heal, she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. Jesus, initially, is silent. You know, you might think of this initially with the begging of, of, of like a child, just nagging, I want the cookie, I want the cookie, I want the cookie, please can I have a snack, please can I have a snack, no, wait for dinner, please can I have a snack, please, and you might think of a parent just being worn down to their absolute last nerve, and then finally just saying, fine, take the cookie, go and leave me alone and let me do what I need to do, but that's not exactly what's happening here, because it's not as if this woman convinced Jesus to do something that was against the Father's will, this was actually all part of the plan, so there had to be something else going on here, Jesus did not lose a debate, and then cave in because the woman convinced her with compelling evidence that he ought to go and heal her daughter. So why did he initially reject her? Turn to Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 and 6. Talking about the priorities of Jesus' ministry, again, I just want to highlight that the healing ministry at this particular time to this particular group of people was not the number one priority of why they were here. Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 through 6. These twelve Jesus sent out, instructing them, Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. This is a theme that is going to come up many, many, many times this morning. So, when Jesus 
after some time of her begging, we don't know exactly how long, after some time of the woman begging, he answers her with this. And it's not a simple yes or no or even the famous maybe. Ask me later. He responds with what I really view as somewhat of a riddle, a riddle that I bashed my face against the desk repeatedly this week trying to figure out. So at first he doesn't respond, but when he finally does, you might read it as harsh or even indifferent at face value. But really, this was a test. So let's look at what Jesus said. Verse 27, let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. And at first glance, you could misinterpret this as Jesus saying, why would I, a Hebrew, Give the bread of the table to a dirty Canaanite dog like yourself. Go find somebody else to pester. That's how we could interpret this passage. But I think it was a test. Because everywhere Jesus has been, we can find hundreds and thousands of people that want to use Jesus. Almost like a, like a, like a magic sort of, um, you know, like a magician or, or, or something like that. They want to use him for his power. But Jesus here is testing the woman to see if she wanted to just use Jesus or if she really knew Jesus and who he was and the significance of his identity. So to understand this riddle, we have to define who is, who's the dog, who are the children, what is the bread or, or the table. And once we pick those apart, it'll, it'll make sense. Now, again, at first it's extremely confusing. At least it was to me. Maybe you're already there and it all clicked and made sense. It took me longer to get there. So at first, it's extremely confusing, but then you look throughout all of Scripture and you see literally the exact same story playing itself out many, 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 many times. And once you go through enough of those examples, it it just jumps off the pages of what the solution actually is. So what is the answer? Well, I'll give you a clue, and then I'll give you the solution, and then I'll try to explain why. So Matthew chapter 15, verse 24, is the clue. Again, this is the parallel account um, in Matthew's gospel. Matthew chapter 15, verse 24. This is your clue. So after she begged him and cried out to, to him and the disciples were annoyed, Jesus answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's the first clue. I think Romans chapter 1, verse 16, which actually is right at the top of the bulletin. So if you want to save some time turning there, you could just take a look. I think that's the solution. In short, Romans 1, 16. For I, Paul, am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. And then the part that oftentimes I don't finish reading and get to, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Right there is the solution because all of the main symbols and characters in in that riddle are represented in that verse. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. So let's pick this apart. The dog. I took a look at the word that was specifically used for this because, again, at first glance, I'm thinking, like, what an insult. (laughs) I mean, who just calls somebody a dog? But there's really, in the New Testament, two words that are used for dog. And one is a a scavenging sort of street rat type of a creature just going around and um, picking up whatever leftovers it can find. And it's it's really ravenous, and it's it's not a, a great, you know, house pet. And the other word, which is actually the one used here, is a, a sort of domesticated puppy. Right? It's, it's a house pet. It's, it's, it's a lap dog. So the Gentiles, um, according to this, this riddle here, the dogs represent the Gentiles who were eating scraps from, of whatever fell from the table that hit the floor. Let me explain. Again, if we interpreted dog the other way, we could apply it to something like this, right? Don't, um, excuse me, take what is holy and give it to the dogs. It's not the same type of dog. 
right? So you could think of it as, well, do we take the holy bread from on top of the table and then we just give it to a Canaanite woman? That's not the way that we ought to read this. It's a different word for dog. This is not an insult. It's differentiating a different category, a different group of people. It's not an insult. Don't feed the dog from the table, but do feed the dog. That's the key. Don't feed the dog from the table, but do feed the dog. The Gentiles were the little dogs that were eating the scraps from the floor. Let's continue to flesh this out. What about the children? The children represent the Jews who were offered the, the first fruits. They had the dinner reservation. They had a seat at the table. They were the first and, and the number one priority for, for Jesus and many of, of the apostles in their ministries. To the Jew first, then to the Gentile. They were given a seat at the table. So the children were the Jews who were sitting at the table. Now, keep in mind, the Jews had a very special relationship with Messiah. Jesus Christ is the Savior for, for all. However, the Jews had a special relationship with Messiah because the gospel was a message that was to be proclaimed to the entire world, yes, but all of that started with promises that were made in Israel. And then from Israel, that gospel would be taken to the entire world. And then the bread represents the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is similar, really, to the relationship between Abraham and God. Because God gave promises and special blessings to Abraham, not for him to selfishly enjoy that for himself, but that in turn, according to, and I'm not going to flip there, but Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, you can see that all those blessings that were given to Abraham for his descendants should have been used to bless the world. So the gospel, you could say the gospel, salvation was given first to the Jews, then to the Gentiles because the Jews were going to bless the world with that gift. Now, Paul, at one point, was perplexed by this relationship between the Jews and the Gentiles. And he admits this, actually, as a confounding mystery. Um, if you want to, you can turn to Ephesians chapter 3, verses 4 through 6. Otherwise, I'll just read it for you. This is Paul speaking. Um, in Ephesians chapter 3, I'm just going to read verses 4 through 6. He admits that it's a, a mystery, <laughs> but he accepts it in faith. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations as it has now been revealed by his holy apostles and prophets in, uh, by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, and members of the same body, and partakers of the same promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. We could see how this would be a perplexing mystery for somebody who, for thousands of years, a people group, have been following Old Testament law, and then here come the Gentiles, and although they didn't have a seat at the table, and have been following this for thousands of years, Jesus comes, and salvation is offered to them all. And, and the blood of Jesus could cover Jew or Gentile. And I'm sure the Jews are thinking, like, how is this even possible? We're your chosen people. So you could see how at, at first glance, and, and of course you could take one of two, of two routes. Jealousy and bitterness for, well, how come those guys get some of the bread? What's with that? I thought we were sitting at the table and enjoying this meal. Why are you giving the bread to the dogs? Or you could accept that in faith like Paul does here and embrace them as your fellow brothers and heirs of the kingdom. So he, he admits it's a mystery. I, I don't get it. But at the same time, he accepts it in faith. Um, backtracking just a couple of pages, Ephesians chapter 2. Um, I just want to highlight a couple verses here. Verse 13. Now in Christ, uh, excuse me, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the, through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. So this, this dividing wall 
go back to verse 11. Uh, Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the uncircumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were once at a time separated from Christ. So at one time you were separated, you were aliens, you were foreigners, and now the dividing wall of hostility has been broken down. And we are one. Acts chapter 13 I won't read the whole account here, but it's a really interesting passage. Um, Paul and Barnabas, I'll just summarize, go to a synagogue and they preach. And the next day, people begged them to come back, which is peculiar. Begged them to come back. Many of the Jews, you know, in, in this example, were excited to hear the message of Paul and Barnabas. Others, not so much. So this is the the day after their initial time teaching in the synagogue. We pick up in Acts chapter 13, um, looking at verse 44. The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. Look Look at what they say in response. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you. Who is he talking to? The angry, jealous Jews. It was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you. Since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. To the Jew first, and then to the Gentile. So unfortunately, many of the Jewish converts were not willing to let go of their elitist jealousy. I think the Galatian church is a really good example of that, um, unfortunately, but it is really eye-opening. I'm just going to read a highlight from that. Galatians chapter 3, starting at verse 7. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. In the scripture foreseeing that God would purify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, in you shall all the nations be blessed. You see that? God would justify the Gentiles by faith. So the gospel presented beforehand, and and that's really interesting how the gospel could be presented before Christ even came. The gospel was presented to Abraham Abraham would, in turn, his, his descendants would become many. That blessing would be extended to the Gentiles. They would be welcomed in, and they'd be offered a seat. And unfortunately, if you uh, keep reading here, I'll just highlight a couple of things. Not everybody was really excited about this arrangement. Uh, I'll skip over to verse 23. Now, before faith came... We were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then, the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you were baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and no female, for all are one in Christ Jesus. Obviously, but because of the climate, I have to say that there is no male or female does not mean that there is not a distinction between male and female in Scripture. It obviously means, pertaining to this text, when, whether it comes to, to salvation, justification, through faith, by grace, through faith, there's no distinction between male or female. I just had to say it. I wish it didn't wasn't so necessary, but it is. So Paul sternly rebukes the Galatians at other points in this text. I think one of the highlights of this rebuke would be uh, verse or chapter three, verse one. Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? The whole tone of this is this letter is one of discipline because they really got it wrong on a lot of key points, and they were adding in all these Old Testament extras to the gospel and thinking that that would make you more holy than the next guy proclaiming Christ. It, it, was, it was a stern rebuke. But this is not what Jesus saw in the woman. He was not joining the anti-Gentile cult. 
in this passage. That's not why he didn't initially grant her the request. The best way I can explain this, I think, in a sort of current day, um, maybe more personal illustration would be with sports. So I'm an Eagles fan, and I have been for a, a long time. I think the first football game I ever watched was the Eagles losing to the Patriots in the Super Bowl, and I think it was 2005, 2004, 2005. And I've been through some really good years, but I remember the 4-12 and 12 Eagles. Andy Reid gets fired, and it's like everything is terrible. We're the laughing stock of the NFC East, which is the laughing stock of the NFL. So, like, we've reached new lows at that point. But then look at what happens next. They get the coach. They get the quarterback. They draft well. Boom. And then we're, we're back in the Super Bowl, and we win it with Nick Foles. And you know what really annoyed me? All the bandwagon Eagles fans who weren't there for the 4-12 and 12 failure, who all of a sudden are sporting, you know, Eagles jerseys. And it's like, who are you? Excuse me, where did you come from? Have you been watching this team since 2005? Were you wearing your Eagles jerseys when we were the laughing stock of the NFL? Johnny, come lately. Like, I don't understand. Well, I think that's how the Jews felt. Who are you? We've been observing this law for thousands of years. You showed up last week. What are you doing here? And many of them could not get past that hurdle. But you know what's interesting? Why did many of the dogs enjoy the crumbs that fell to the floor more than the children enjoyed having a seat at the table? Three reasons. I can prove it with extra verses if you want to see them. Talk to me. Don't have time to flip there. Romans 11, 1 through 10, their hearts were hardened. Number two, Romans 9, 30 to 33, they rested on their works rather than their faith. And number three, from Romans 11, 11 through 20, they were jealous to see the Gentiles offered the crumbs. And entitlement is the enemy of grace. So what can we learn? God has not withdrawn his offer to Israel for eternal life and replaced them with the Gentiles. And now, sorry, Israel, you had your chance. There's no salvation for you. The bread was presented to Israel. The Gentiles are scooping up the crumbs, and they are eager to do so. But that doesn't mean that the book is closed and that salvation is not available to the Jews. The problem is, with a hardened heart, how could you come to the gospel? Second thing is the children of Israel come first. So his priority was not to give the children's food to the puppy under the table. However, when the woman answers, yes, Lord, that revealed a, a number one, a, a heart of humility. And it showed even more belief than, than previous audiences he had with the Pharisees. The third thing I think we can learn from that riddle is we are the dogs. In, in a couple ways, I guess as Gentiles, number one, but two, we have no special claim or privilege to salvation. We can't boast any sort of in entitlement on, on, on our own salvation. We should just be exceedingly thankful for the mere crumb that fell from the table and, and made it to me. That crumb is more valuable than anything. And it's amazing to me that the woman was more content with that crumb that fell from the table than many of the Jews were to have a seat at the dinner party. She says, yes, Lord. Number one on the list of things you would not expect a Syrophoenician woman to say. And in Matthew's gospel, you can see she says, Lord, the son of David. David was arch nemesis. <laughs> and Solomon and, and all those Israelite kings leading conquests to wipe out the Canaanites. Why would she recognize him as Lord, son of David with all that bitterness and animosity, historically speaking? She knew who she was talking to. This was a test that the woman passed with flying colors. And we had an idea she was going to pass first when she, when she addressed him as Lord. But then when you see her answer, it, it gets even wilder. She responds to Jesus with this line. Yet... 
as if to say, well, yes. However, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Her response indicates to me she was tracking with this analogy and somehow managed to understand her place. She recognized her place in the story. Jesus responds to this statement, you may go your way, the demon has left. The Pharisees were offered a seat at the table and they turned it down. They rejected it. And this woman walks away with just a mere crumb, but that's all she wanted. And that's what she got, and she was exceedingly thankful for that. Really quick, we are wrapping up. I do promise. Matthew 15, again, back to the parallel account, verse 28. Jesus addresses her as having great faith. Great faith. That's, a, that's a, a, a qualifier that was only used one other place in the New Testament. Do we know who it was? Any guesses? The centurion was also a Gentile of all the people <laughs> to commend for their faith. It's two Gentiles. Why is that? Here's one explanation from MacArthur. This woman's faith was not great because it was stronger or more sincere or mature than the faith of many Jews who believed in Christ, but because it was based on such little sight. They hadn't observed with a front row seat how God had provided for them going back through their entire history their slavery in Egypt, the crossing of the Red Sea, even before that, they didn't have a front row seat. But with the small encounter that they have with Christ, they walk away being applauded for having great faith. It's incredible. So Jesus' ministry, in short, was to to the Jew first, but crumbs did fall. So she went home, and she actually found the child resting. Which, Just as a side note, That was probably the best rest that that child has ever had. She's been tormented by a demon. She's a little child. So you would would assume that a lot of her, if not most of her life, has been spent tormented by this thing. And yet the mother comes home and finds her asleep in her bed, and the demon was gone. What an amazing account, and, and that's obviously something we can apply to our life with Christ, the rest that we can enjoy. Not like a physical laziness, but a spiritual peace and rest. While all this craziness is going on, we can rest secure in in God's sovereignty, and, and the rest of the world cannot do that. So then he returns from the region, and I'm not going to go through every single detail of, of this story with the man, uh, the deaf man that Jesus heals, but I do want to point the connection between the two and why these passages are being studied on the same Sunday. So after uh, Jesus gets done uh, ministering to and healing the Syrophoenician woman, he packs up and he returns to the region. So the bridge between these two passages is really the responses of the people that Jesus touched. Their encounter with Jesus made it so that they could not help but proclaim. They were absolutely absolutely astonished by his life-changing ability and the salvation offered that they could not help but proclaim. So I heard this comparison. Jesus going into Gentile territory, ter- territory and then going back to Galilee, if you look at his route that he took, he actually made a, a giant horseshoe. So if the objective was to start from Tyre and go to the Sea of Galilee, what he actually did was, let's say you're trying to make, I, I heard this illustration, you're trying to make a trip from Rich, Richmond to Washington, D.C. But instead of just going from Richmond to Washington, D.C., you take a giant horseshoe-shaped detour through Philadelphia. It was a 120-mile trip. So, again, I don't think that he just goes to this, these places on a whim. He's there to do the Father's will. So even though I don't have the details of exactly, nobody just packs up and takes a spontaneous 120-mile trip for absolutely no reason at all. Even the, the, um, the free spirits at least want to, they have some sort of objective, something they want to see, something they want to do. 
So he gets to, back to um, the Sea of Galilee, and they bring him a man who was deaf. And we read that Jesus puts his fingers in his ears, and after spitting, touched his tongue. And in that moment, really, if you look at the word used here, he, he, was, he was opened up. Ephatha. He was opened up. Ears that were closed, a mouth that was sealed, that could not speak. Completely opened up. They were freed, but they were opened up. And isn't that a picture of our salvation experience? Completely enslaved in bondage to sin, and now opened up. So Jesus charged them, very curious line, to tell no one. The more he charged, the more zealously they proclaimed it. So not only could this man hear, but he could also speak. And boy, did he speak. Because he can finally speak, but now he's charged not to speak. But after having not been able to speak, he couldn't help himself but speak about what just happened. So why did Jesus say that? I mean, doesn't that seem like the most counterproductive thing? Jesus is, is going through his whole teaching ministry, and, and later on in Matthew 28, Great Commission, go therefore into all the world and preach the gospel. So why did he tell them to be quiet? Uh, wasn't he shooting his own ministry in the foot? There are maybe s several reasons. I mean, the crowds were already enormous, and if people are going around and spreading the word that could multiply thousands and thousands of people, then Jesus would just be completely swamped by the crowds and couldn't go anywhere and do the things that the Father had instructed for him to do. That is a, a, a very real concern. However, consider this. Flip over to Mark chapter 8, verse 11. This is just a few verses later. I think Jesus had exactly an idea what was going to happen, and there was a reason that he, he told them to stay silent for a time. Mark chapter 8, verse uh, 11. The Pharisees came and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, Why does this generation seek a sign? Truly, I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. And he left them, got into the boat again, and went to the other side. This is one of many examples where Jesus, also Paul and Barnabas, which I forgot to mention in, in their encounter in Acts, they all shake the dust off their feet and they leave. You can see the same line. So, Mark 8, 11 to 12, all the people wanted was a sign. That's all they wanted. Give us a sign. Give us a sign. And no matter how many signs they were given, it wasn't enough. He could have given them a thousand signs. And they still, because of their hardened heart, would have rejected it. It, it. They weren't just missing a sign. That wasn't the reason. There was something else going on here. All they wanted was a sign to the point where Jesus refused it to them. It made me realize we can rationalize faith right out of our religion. Just demand a sign. Show it to me. Show it to me. When is it going to happen? Well, then what about the great faith? of the woman who with such little information or the centurion after one encounter with Jesus had enough faith to accept him. But all that these people wanted, all these Pharisees wanted was a sign. The amazing signs and wonders that Jesus was, was providing would have been meaningful and compassionate to the person who received it, but it could have been a stumbling block for the people clamoring for a sign. He charged them not to go out and to, to proclaim it. Of course, those people were so touched they couldn't help themselves. But that very thing, that very miraculous work could have actually been a stumbling block to people who were asking and begging for a sign. Now, just note that this was a specific command to a specific group of people, and it was not at all a contradiction to the Great Commission. But it does show us that the gospel is life-changing in an absolute sense. So, as we close, we share something in common with both of these individuals. Our salvation story is very similar to this woman because we too are the Gentiles that have been grafted into the kingdom. We are the ones that have been blessed by the outpouring of Abraham's blessing, and now we're essentially we're, we're having a seat at the same table, you could say. 
And we can really relate to the second individual because before the Holy Spirit, we are spiritually deaf and we are spiritually mute just like this man. I mean, what what useful inc- information about the scriptures could we possibly hear and to speak without the Holy Spirit? The message of the cross was foolishness to us. They were astonished beyond measure. I just want to close with this quote uh, from R.C. Sproul. No matter how hard people try to hide Jesus, he cannot be hidden, even in the dark places of the world. And boy, is the world trying. The world is trying to just close him up, lock up, you know, lock him up in a box, throw out the key, and just away with this. I mean, it's a miracle, honestly, that Christians could disagree with the world on literally everything. Everything. You would think that there would be something that we could, you know, share in common and we could bond over. There isn't. There isn't. And, and the further that we get in our history, the more Jesus and his teachings are going to be shoved into what they perceive is out of the way. But no matter how hard they try, Jesus can't be hidden. Even in the darkest places of the world, he cannot be hidden. So back to our big idea. Let's see if you still remember it, kids. Right? If God is so great, remember, we know that he is. If God is so great, we cannot help to the test. Let's pray, guys. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this time uh, that we've been able to study your word together, and I just pray that every single day that we live, every opportunity that we have to spend a day, I pray that we would do so in full remembrance of the cross and the price that was paid to bring us back into fellowship with you. I just pray that we wouldn't approach our salvation with any sort of, of bitterness or jealousy to those who are new to the faith. I pray that we wouldn't um, face the, the cross with any sort of entitlement, like we deserved it. But Lord, I pray that we would really treat this like the woman who was just happy to receive a crumb. And Lord, I just pray that that gratefulness and that thanksgiving would really be evident in our own lives, especially in the next couple of weeks, thinking about Thanksgiving. I just pray that we wouldn't wait until next Thanksgiving to be thankful for our salvation, but that that attitude would be something that characterizes us each and every day. I just pray that as we sing, as we close, that really the the message, the, the lyrics to these songs would just really settle deep in our hearts and that we would remember that we are we are saved. We have eternal security by the blood of Jesus Christ alone, and by your grace. And we are so exceedingly thankful for that. May we go out just like that man. I pray that our evangelism would be um, something that can't be contained. We we just can't help ourselves, but to tell the world about the saving power of the gospel. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.